Let's pray together. Father, we just, we couldn't express anything, Father, more pertinent to our lives and more expressive of, of our need today. And Father, I just love, love that. Lord, we, our prayer is that you would set our hearts up there in the heavenly realms where your truth abounds and your truth reigns in perfect righteousness, that we want to be there. And we want your will done here on this earth as it is done there. And so we do pray that you would gird our lives, that you would fill our lives today, that they would be protected, that they would be guarded and armored with all of these virtues that we're going to be talking about. Uh, Lord, our fight is a fight to set people free. And it's the truth that will set us free. And so in that, we, we want to hold forth the word. We want to hold forth the truth. We want to hold it up with courage. We want to hold it up, God, with compassion and with, uh, with the wisdom that you've given to us. All these things that we need, we find in the person of Christ. And so we just want to right now exalt Jesus and say to you, Father, thank you for giving us the gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness, the gift of renewal and transformation that our hearts so desperately need, and we find that in the person of Jesus. So we're here for you. Thank you for your people gathered here, and we pray all this in the beautiful, powerful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. All right, thank y'all. Y'all can be seated. We're going to continue singing uh, because he lives, we can face tomorrow, and uh, it's a great hymn of our faith and assurance. Uh, that we can follow him. All right, let's sing it. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives because he lives i can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because i know the future and life is worth the living just because he lives my faith my faith has found a resting place not in device nor creed i trust the ever living one his wounds for me shall plead I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves, this ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. 
I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, living word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Incredible story. Uh, let's take our Bibles this morning and let's turn to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. And let me just uh, remind you kind of where kind of where we are if you just sort of stepped in here this morning. And uh, you're like, what, you know, probably wondering where, where in the world did, did this topic kind of drop out of? Uh, we have been talking for several weeks now about uh, values, different values that we know that the Bible uh, gives us that God is very, that, that are very precious to the heart of God. And we're just trying to learn those, what those values are. And we're trying to apply, not just to know these values, but we're trying to apply these values to the choices that we make. And we want to be people that are taking very seriously the opportunity that God's given to us, the freedom that he's given to us to make choices, but to make those choices according to his word and according to the things that are near and dear to the heart of God. So <clears throat> we're identifying some of the more common and some of the more relevant uh, topics of our day where uh, the Bible speaks to these and where the, where the Bible Id identifies truly what is the truth of God, what is the value that God holds forth. And so if we're going to follow him and if we're going to be his people, then we're going we're gonna to be there also. So this is one of those topics today that we're going to talk about what the Bible says about one of the most emotional and maybe personal issues of our day, and that is, what does the Bible say about abortion? As we look at this together, I have the feeling that some of you are sort of like me, kind of as you approach this, because you have this incredible conflict of emotions when it comes to this subject. And all these emotions are powerful. They are very, uh, they are, they are very potent in, in their ability to sort of take over our life and and, and to affect us in deep ways. Um, so let me just flow through some of those emotions. Um, I know I have within me one powerful emotion that I, I would like to think, and I, I really believe this before God, is that it's righteous anger. Uh, I have that emotion that babies are being aborted by the millions uh, every year in America. Uh, that grieves my heart, but it does sort of stir some righteous anger. Right alongside of that is another powerful emotion, and that's compassion. Uh, compassion for those who've perhaps been trapped into abortions, those who are dealing with the guilt of this in their life, uh, a compassion for what so many are going through in our country today because of this. Right, song, uh, uh, right alongside of that would be, a, be the strong heartache, just just an aching, broken heart for what I consider to be a national tragedy. And I'll speak a little bit more of that in just a moment. And then alongside of that is another strong anger for those who choose to do crazy things, you know, like bomb or kill, to try to stop the killing. Uh, it's bizarre. Um, so I have all of that in me, and with all of those powerful emotions, there comes some options that we have in how we're going to respond to this. And so those options run the gamut of that one is that you can sort of zero in on one of these emotions and get kind of stuck in one of those. And some people do that. They'll focus just on the anger, and the anger will take them to places that 
certainly God doesn't want us to go. Or they'll focus just on compassion and love. And let me just say this, it's a lot easier to get sort of fixated on that to the neglect of the truth because it's just a lot easier. <laughs> it's just a lot less complicated if I can just kind of phase out all the other stuff and pretend all the other stuff is not there and I'm just going to focus in on love and compassion. And we need to be compassionate, but that's not all there is to it. Another option is just to freeze up and do nothing. And I'll just confess to you, that happens to me. That happens to me, not just on this topic, but other topics that, that, that are really, really relevant. There's so many inputs. There, 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 there's just so many. There's, I feel like sometimes there's so much stuff coming in, and it's overwhelming, and there's so much kind of going on around me, and there's so much stimulus and so much information that's available, and so what do you do with it? You just sort of crash, and you just sort of freeze up. You care, you care about it, but not much is done because you just kind of freeze up and do nothing. So I think the other option is to find the balance that on a lot of these topics we do find in the scriptures. We find the balance in God's word and then follow, follow what God's word says. Actually, Put yourself in action, but you're doing so behind and alongside of God's word. And in that, you're finding the ability to start making some sense out of these things. And that's really, really good. And that's why I love the Bible. That's why I love God's word, because it does that. Because when you go to God's word, that's where, where you're going to find the peace that you need. It's going to be where you're going to find the hope that you need, the direction, the guidance. And it's where you're going to find the strength. Uh, to do what God wants us to do. Uh, there's basically four or five different ways that you can talk about this debate. So I wanted to kind of uh, let you know that I'll, I'll touch on, I'll just barely touch on, you know, maybe, maybe three of these, and then we're going to really, really focus and lean into the last one. But one way that you can talk about abortion is from the viewpoint of science. What does science say about this? What does science say about when life begins and what abortion is about? Sometimes we can talk about it from the standpoint of statistics. You can read all kinds of resources, and the statistics are incredible and can be extremely overwhelming. Sometimes you can approach this topic from the standpoint of stories. We just heard a story. Very powerful story, right? And but here, here's what can happen. One side of this whole thing can tell a story that'll kind of get you crying about it. And then the other side can tell a story and can get you crying about that. They can get you crying about somebody who has faced an abortion, whose life has been ruined by it, or whose life has been ruined by not having one. And so you can always find a story that can get you crying about this issue, and that can be very emotional. Uh, but another way to look at this and to consider it is to do it through the lens of Scripture and God's Word. And so we're going to, as I said, we're going to touch on maybe these other things, but we're going to focus on that last one. We're going to focus on the Scripture. Because y'all know this, I am not a scientist. <laughs> I'm not a scientist. I can read about things. Uh, about science, I can understand some things, but I'm not a scientist. I'm not a statistician. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not one of those guys, okay? I do, every once in a while, tell stories. I love stories, so I can tell a story, but mostly I know what I know most of is I know things about God's Word, and that's where I love to be. So, I'm going to be basically, mainly, primarily today, talking to believers. I'm going to be talking to most of you are a believer in Christ, and I hope that you're sort of hungry like I am. I want to know what the Bible says about this. I want to know what the Scripture says about this issue. What does the Bible say? Does the Bible have some answers? And we believe it does. So here's the way that you'll, <clears throat> you'll hear um, this whole 
subject kind of framed, you'll hear terms like pro-life. Well, so what about life? What about life? If, if that's one of the issues, then we better talk about that. And we'd better determine what does God say about life. Okay? Um, what about choice? We hear a lot about pro-choice. So what about choice? If that's one of the issues, then we need to talk about choice. And we need to learn and find what God says about choice. Uh, and then something that sort of gets lost in all this other rhetoric is the issue, well, what about forgiveness? You know, Gene talked a lot about forgiveness and restoration and redemption. So what about that? So that's going to be our little outline today. We're going we're gonna to talk about life. What is life? We're going to talk about choice. You know, what is choice? And then we're going to talk about forgiveness and redemption, okay? So that's going to be kind of how we're going to flow through this. So let's start with, let's write this in, big question, what about life? What about life? And the, the big, uh, probably the issue here is when does life begin? So we need to really determine, does God speak to this? Does God's word speak to this? Does the Bible have some answers to this? When does life begin? So that's why I've had you turn to Psalm 139, because we do believe that God's word speaks to this. So look with me at Psalm 139, and let's go to verse 13. It says, for you, David speaking here, for you, God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body, and all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. So in beautiful, poetic, uh, psalm-type language, David here talks about life. So let's do a little Bible study here, uh, really short, quick, uh, truths about every one of us. These are truths about everyone in this room, every one of us before, these are truths before you were even born. So what, so what are they? Number one, write it in, God created me. So before I was even born, God created me. That's what David is saying here. So that's true of David, true of me, true of you, true of everybody. Number two, God saw me. God saw me. God saw this unformed substance called my body. He saw that. He saw it in the womb. Your eyes saw what was happening. God's eyes saw all that was happening there. And then number three, God planned my days. All of my days, before I was born, God ordained all of my days. So, question, does that sound like life? Absolutely, it's life. Creation of God, seen by God, understood by God, planned by God, all the days of my life planned by God, and it's life. So <clears throat> we're going to continue uh, to walk through some scripture here because the question that I want to deal with that's sort of on this thing about life and what is life and when does life begin and so forth. How do we know that when a baby is conceived in the womb, how do we know that it's alive? How do we know that it's a person? How do we know that? And again, from the Bible, there are some really important truths that we can, that we can anchor ourselves to. Number one, write this in. We know that the baby in the womb is alive because the unborn are called babies in the Bible. The babies call, the Bible calls babies in the womb babies. And that's the word that the Bible uses. So a great example of this is in, is in Luke. You have Luke chapter 1 where you read the story about John the Baptist. And you read the story about Elizabeth. And Elizabeth is pregnant with John the Baptist. 
and Mary comes to talk to her about what's going on with her. And so the Bible says that Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting and the baby in her womb leaped for joy. That's what the Bible says. Luke chapter 1, verse 41. It says the baby in the womb, in Elizabeth's womb, leaped for joy. She heard the greeting of Mary and the baby who was John the Baptist leaped for joy in the womb. Then you go to Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, you read this. This will be a sign to you that you will find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a, what? In a manger. What baby's that? That's Jesus. So the baby Jesus and the baby still in Elizabeth's womb, very same Greek word. In both of those cases, same Greek word used for baby. It's not that one is called some unformed substance and the other called a baby. It's the same Greek word, baby, infant, human being. Every pregnant woman refers to her unformed, unborn baby as a baby, don't you? A baby. I've never heard a pregnant woman say, I'm carrying a product of conception in my stomach. I've never heard that. I've never heard a woman say, I'm carrying a mass of cells in my stomach. Never heard that. It is a baby. It's not a tissue mass. It's a baby. God and his word confirms this. He uses the same word, baby, for that which is carried in the womb and that which has been born. Same word. And I just make a point of that because, listen, folks, the words in God's word are important. And that's why I love, I love the Bible study that goes on on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock in these classrooms. I love the Bible study that goes on with our men on Tuesday nights, our ladies on Thursday nights, because we're looking at some of those words. And those words are important. And they're important because God chose those words. God chose those words for a reason, and the Holy Spirit inspired those words, and they're there for our benefit and for our guidance and for instructing us in the way that's true. So that's the first reason that when a baby's conceived, it, it's, it's, it's alive. It's a person, and that is because the unborn are called babies. The second reason is the unborn are created by God. The unborn are created by God. That's what the psalmist, that's what David is saying in Psalm 139. He's saying, God, you created my inmost being. You, God, knit me together in that hidden place. So what we're talking about here inside that womb is a creation of God. It's not just merely a creation of a man and a woman. It's a creation of God himself. Number three, in the Bible, it says that the unborn possess distinctive human traits. So once again, in the womb, like in Elizabeth's case, there was a sense of joy in the child, in the womb. So the unborn, the Bible is going to tell us they possess distinctive human traits. So with Elizabeth, it was joy. In Psalm 51, we'll look at that in just a moment, David talks about the fact that even from his conception, he was conceived in sin. So both joy and sin are there in the womb from the very beginning. Conceived in sin means that we, we all are born with a sin nature, with the propensity and the bentness toward disobedience. That's why you have to teach a child to be obedient. You don't have to teach them to be disobedient. It comes rather natural, doesn't it? It just pops out, just comes out. So conceived in sin simply means that we all have that sin nature. So in the womb, there's both joy and there's sin. And every mom understands this because you have felt the kicks, right? And sometimes those kicks are joyful kicks and sometimes they're sinful kicks. I don't know that you can really tell the difference. I don't know, but anyway, already there. I, th I, th I think that's enough on that, okay? So um, already present human traits, distinctive human traits. Number four. The Bible says in Psalm 139, the unborn are said to be known intimately and personally by God. 
That's what David says, that he's known intimately by God. My frame was not hidden from you, God, when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. So the unborn are said to be known intimately, personally by God. And then number five, I, like, I really like this one. The unborn are called by God even before birth. So even before birth, we have the record where we are called, we are set apart for God. <clears throat> we are set apart for his glory and for his purpose. And I, can, I could give you many examples, probably some of the ones that I really like kind of more than the others, Genesis 25. Man, you read that. That's about Rebecca and these two uh, babies that are kind of jostling within her, in her womb. And she said, why is this, God, why is this happening to me? And the Bible says that she went and she inquired. She asked the Lord. She said, Lord, I need some wisdom here. I need some perspectives. Now, the two babies inside of her are Esau and Jacob. And they're in the womb. Listen to this. They're fighting it out. They're fighting in the womb. So when she asked what was going on, God didn't say, well, there's two tissue masses that are having something, you know, going on there, sort of a medical thing. That's not what God said. The Lord said to her, two, listen to this, two nations are within you, and two peoples are within you, and they will be separated. And one of those people are going to be stronger than the other, and the older by the way, the older is going to what? Serve the younger. That's pretty human, right? That's a pretty human thing, what's going on inside of her womb. Isaiah 49, what Isaiah says about himself. Isaiah says, listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. Isaiah. He says, from my birth, he's made mention of my name. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, to gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and God has been my strength. Isaiah, formed in the womb for God's purpose. This is, listen, simply what the Bible says about when life begins. Paul said it like this, Galatians chapter 1, but God had special plans for me and set me apart for his word even, he says, before I was born. All of that is in the scriptures. So there's not one verse that you're going to go to in the Bible that says thou shalt not abort a baby. You're not going to find that verse. But when you begin to add up all of these things that we're talking about, it's pretty clear from God's word there is life there. There's life, and I think that right there makes an entirely incredible difference in this debate. If the unborn child, listen carefully, if the unborn child is not a person, if the unborn child is not a living person, no excuse for abortion is necessary. But listen, if the unborn child is a living person, no excuse for abortion is acceptable by God. Why? Because life is life. Life is life. Whether it's just conceived, whether it's one day old or just born, or one year old or 96 years old, it's alive. When we talk about this issue of when life begins, I believe God's word has these incredible things to say and we've just kind of scratched the surface of that. One of the reasons, I'll, I'll just add this, why the debate uh, about abortion is intensifying so much is that it's not just Christians, and it's not just believers who are saying this, but more and more, listen to this, science is showing us what Scripture has told us all along. And increasingly, there's more scientists that are giving us this window on life itself. One of the things that really began this was the ultrasound. And this happened way back, way back when. When you, when, when you could start to look in and 
and see. And interesting, interestingly, Roe versus Wade and the ultrasound came in at about the same time in America. But through the ultrasound, we can, we can know what's going on in the womb. And it was an incredible thing. And since then, it just continued. We know just when you have hands moving, you have the heart beating. It's very difficult when I see, when I see it, it's difficult to say that that's just a product of conception. Difficult to say that. Because by the second month, by the second month, eight weeks, brain waves are detected, 40 to 42 days, a nose, eyes, ears, toes appear, the heart beats, its own blood starts to flow, a skeleton develops, it has its own unique fingerprints. By the third month, it swallows. They can suck it, you know, suck their thumb. They can feel pain between the eighth and the thirteenth week. Listen, he or she is alive. They are a living person. A living person. So that's the question about life. There's another question that we better, better get to, and that is the question of choice. There are two major, I think these are the two big questions that we hear most about in our culture. When does life begin? And then what about choice? So, Brother Tim, what about choice today? When, where do our rights end? What about this? And I do want to recognize the fact that as we begin to talk about this, it's not always primarily the woman's choice that results in an abortion. Sometimes it's a boyfriend that is pressuring the issue. Sometimes it's parents that are pressuring the issue. So many times other pressures are being brought to bear in that choice. But when it comes to the issue of choice about our bodies, did, did, you, hear, did you hear Gene talk a little bit about that? So... This is an important question about the choice that I have. This is my body, and I can choose what I want to happen to my body. Well, for the believer, this to me is a rather, the Bible gives us a rather obvious answer to this. So it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, and I want to put it up on the screen. Let's read this together, so read this out loud with me. Ready, go. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So as believers, listen to this, we're kind of going counterculture here. Now, we do this on lots of things. This, is a, this shouldn't you know, surprise us because we're people who are following God. We're applying God's values to everyday choices. And what that means is we're going to be swimming upstream. We're going to be kind of going against the current. And this is one of those places where I think we go against the current. When the world says, hey, you're your own. You can do whatever you want to with your body. Ugh. We say, as followers of Christ, ugh, there's, a, there's a different side to that. There's the whole reality that you know what? As a believer in Christ, I've given my life over now to Christ. And Paul's right. I'm not my own. I'm now owned by him. He's my master. He is the Lord of my life. He's given his life for me. He bought me with his death and with his life subsequent. I'm not my own. This is not my life. This is his life. This is his body. By virtue of creation, he created me, but also by virtue of redemption. He redeemed me. He bought me with the price of his own son. So therefore, what do I want to do? I want to give glory to God. I want to honor him with my what? My body. It's his body. It's not my own. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Well, you say, okay, well, that's fine. What about someone who's not a believer? Do we have the right as believers to tell an unbeliever what to do with their bodies? You know what? That is a great question. I love that question. People, even Christians, can say things like this. Brother Tim, I'm really personally opposed to abortion. 
I don't know how many politicians I've heard say this. I, 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 I'm personally opposed to it. But I just don't feel like I have the right to tell a woman what she should or shouldn't do with her body. Listen, that statement only makes sense if that which is within the womb is not a human life. But if it's a human life, then you and I have every moral right to say, this is what God says about it. God says it's a life. And if it's a life, it's to be protected. If it's a life, you and I then have a moral obligation to say, this is what God says about it. This is what his word says, and that's where I'm going to be. We have the moral obligation to be there. Now, I'm, uh, I am fully aware that in America, we have a legal right to an abortion. That is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a moral right, and we have a moral, biblical obligation to stand up and say abortion is wrong. As much as it's wrong for that one-year-old who's already been born to be killed, or that 13-year-old to be killed, or that 96-year-old man to be killed, it's just as wrong for the unborn to be killed. That's our moral obligation. Back in 1993, there was a prayer breakfast that was held in Washington, D.C. Mother Teresa was speaking, 1993, quite a, quite a while ago. And she sort of shocked that audience that day when she stood up and she said that America once, listen to this, a generous nation has become a selfish nation. She had lots of illustrations that day. You know what her number one Example was, it was abortion. Here's the most respected woman in the world looking at a country and saying, your choice about this matter is hurting your nation. And it's just one example that you're selfish. You're selfish. Judges 21 tells us what happens when we go our own way. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. That pretty much lays it out where we are. <laughs> Everybody is doing as they see fit. And sometimes we're so focused on the God of individual choice, and it is a God, it is an idol, individual choice, that we lose sight of how those choices are impacting an entire culture, an entire country. Listen, church, this is nothing new, what we're talking about today. Uh, in the Bible, in Egypt, when they wanted the babies out, out of the way, they killed them all. That's why we love the story about Moses, you know, being redeemed and saved by being put in a little basket. We love that story, right, because God saved him. In Bethlehem, when Herod wanted all the babies killed, he was selfishly afraid that there would be a king that would take his place, and that one fear caused him to kill all the male babies to and under in Bethlehem. So it's in the Bible. This is nothing new. Why? Because children are innocent, and particularly the unborn child is innocent. The unborn child is defenseless. And God takes that defenseless kind of status very, very, very seriously. You want to see how serious God takes this? Look up on the screen. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16 through 19 says six things the Lord hates. And then he says, oh, by, by the way, there's seven. Seven things that are detestable to God. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and, by the way, a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Whew. We want to talk about that at all? Look at number three, though. Hands that shed innocent blood. That's it. Hands that shed defenseless blood. As I look at this, and even now, God, right now, feeling sort of the pain of this, I also feel the pain that maybe even some of you have today because of this. 
Maybe some of you in this room have in your past been involved in an abortion choice. It may have been your choice. It may not have been so much your choice. Maybe you were one of those that felt pressured by somebody to make that choice. But there may be some of you this morning that are saying, what do I do now? Where do I go now? Kind of after the fact. So that's why this third question I think is really, really important. And that's the question, what about forgiveness? What about redemption? What about restoration? So that's where we go to Psalm 51. Let me fl flow through this pretty quickly with you. David teaches us four things in Psalm 51 about resolving the guilt of our sin and the hurt that sin brings to our life. So what does David say about this? How do we, how do we experience forgiveness? So let's, let's go through some points here, and then I'll read some scriptures from Psalm 51. I think you begin, let's write this in, with a request for mercy. You say, God, I want mercy. I need mercy. According to your love, I want mercy. So this is what he says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. This is Psalm 51, verse 1. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. So here's the deal, folks. I need mercy today. You need mercy. We all need the mercy of God. And this is where we start. We don't start by saying, I'm going to pull myself up by my own bootstraps and make this thing work. We start by saying, God, I'm poor in spirit. I'm bankrupt in spirit. I'm broken in my spirit. I need your mercy, God. I don't deserve your mercy, but in your, in your love for me, I know your love is unfailing. And I know that because of what you've done for me in Christ. So that's where to start. Number two, say your sin to God. This is what confession is. Just confess your sin to God. Say your sin to God out loud. Whatever your sin is. Verse three says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. And you're right, God, in your verdict. And you're justified when you judge me. So what is David doing here? He's just being clear about it. Saying what's happened. Transgression simply means this, literally, to step over the line. So he's saying, God, I've done it. I've stepped over the line. And the Bible says that every single one of us in this room is a transgressor. That when we talk about the sin of murder or the sin of abortion or sexual sins or lying or stealing or gossip, any of those kind of things, every one of us, listen, is a transgressor. Do we get that today? Every one of us is a transgressor. So when we talk about the sin of abortion, remember, hey, listen, every one of us have sinned. Every one of us have stepped over that line. Some of us do it really boldly, you know, with the attitude, man, I'm not going to let anybody run my life. I'm not even going to let God run my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. And others of us do it rather timidly. We just barely kind of sneak him. We just sneak over that line. But you know what? It's all transgression. It's all sin. We all need the mercy of God, every one of us. So say your sin to God out loud. Number three, ask for renewal as well as forgiveness. Ask for renewal. And this is where David gets going. Cleanse me with hyssop. I'll be clean. Wash me. I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Create in me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit. Don't cast me from your presence, restore to me the joy, don't we love that, restore to me the joy of your salvation, grant to me a willing spirit. What happens here is I think we're good at asking God for forgiveness and we accept his forgiveness, but we don't ask him for and accept his renewal of our life. So we say, okay, I, I think I'm forgiven and I know that that means that I'm probably going to go to heaven, but man, I'm miserable. <laughs> I'm still miserable. Why? Because I did something wrong. I did something really wrong. And what I did was wrong, and I know it, and I know it was really, really, really wrong. And so you spend the rest of your earthly life taking it out on yourself. God doesn't want you to do that. God does not want you to do that. David prays one of the most beautiful prayers and says, God, I do need your forgiveness, but would you, along with that forgiveness, would you renew me? 
by your grace and by your power. Listen, Jesus can do that. Amen? Jesus can renew you because of what he's done for you already at the cross. It's finished. It's done. Not because of what you and I can do, but because of what he's already done for us. Not just to clear us, but to cleanse us from within. This is what renewal is. God, give me a new life. Give me a new heart. Give me back the joy that I once had. God can do that. God can answer that prayer. God can cleanse you in your heart, give you a new sense of purity and a new sense of righteousness. So ask for that and expect that and let it happen in your life. And then number four, tell others of what God has done for you. Tell others. Turn it into a ministry. Just like Gene here, just turn it into a ministry. Tell people the story about how God has redeemed you. David says, then I will teach transgressors, other transgressors. <laughs> I will teach them then your ways, O God, so that sinners will turn back to you. So do this. There's something healing, powerfully, powerful healing about encouraging someone else how God's forgiven you and how he's restored you. So what can we do about this? Let me give you three quick things. Number one, we need to politically make a stand. So we need to be clear about where we stand on this. And by the way, we need to do this compassionately. We have to make a stand. We, folks, church, listen, we have to make a stand. Amen? Oh, we have to stand up. And we have to say from God's word, it's life. In the womb, it's life. It's human life. And it has the right to live and to fulfill what God has planned. It's a baby. But we also must make that stand compassionately. Because if the way that we deal with abortion, if, it, if the way that we deal with it, if it keeps people out of the kingdom of God, we've just added one tragedy on top of another one. Look at the life of Jesus. Look at how he dealt with this. He called sin what it, what it was. He called it out, but he was very compassionate about it, right? J.M. Clark says a politician thinks only of the next election. A statesman thinks of the next generation. We need to be electing statesmen, not politicians. I'd add to that a Christian thinks of eternity. That's where we think. Not of some sorry election. Yeah, we think of the next generation, but we think of eternity. Personally, let's make some sacrifices to save children's lives. So politically, we're going to make a stand. Personally, we're going to make some sacrifices to save children's lives. For some of you, it might mean adoption. Some of us may need to step up and say, I'm, I'm willing to adopt. Some of you, it might mean take care of a grandchild. You know, we think we're done. God can laugh at that, can't he? For some of you, it might mean that you might want to give up a child for an adoption. I, I don't know anybody here that would be considering that. But that can certainly, certainly happen. It means to sacrifice yourself in some way to save the lives of children. What sacrifices are we willing to make to save lives? And then prayerfully, here's my last one, ask God to draw our nation to Christ. Man. I don't know. I don't know, folks. I don't know about America. But I know that we should be asking God to draw our nation to Christ. Regard Smith says, in the great battle for hearts and minds, a wistful, pro-choice generation is watching. Have we given them any reason to choose life? <laughs> Have we given them reason to put the God of creation above their individual choice? That's why we need to go to school on this stuff. And we need to know the answers. 
And I, I feel like this morning I've given you some answers, but you know what? I feel like in some ways I've just scratched the surface. But I just, I just know in my heart I'm right. It's not because I'm right, it's because God's right. And God's revealed himself on this. So let's give people the reason to consider life, life in the womb. Let's give them reason to put the God of creation above the God of individual choice. We should all do those things and do these things. And please note with me today, the problem is not political. It's not primarily political. It's not primarily legal. The problem is not primarily medical. The problem is primarily spiritual. When you and I look at this issue, it overwhelms our life. Even right now, as I'm talking, I feel overwhelmed. And that says this, people need the Lord. Amen? People need the Lord. They need Jesus Christ like they've never in their life needed him. We need Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would give us a heart of passion for an issue that might be the very issue that is most standing between this country and you, yourself. We beg your mercy that if you've not already done so, please, Lord, don't take your hand off of this country. Give us a heart of compassion for those lives around us that are being torn apart You'll help us, Lord, strike the balance with, with, with this to be truthful, but to be loving. Lord, help us to know exactly when to make the stand, to know exactly the right way to do it, and exactly when to share the compassionate love in just the right way. We do know that we need to be your hands and feet in this world, that you see the hurt better than we. You see the million-plus abortions that are happening in our country every year. And you know about every one of them. You know about every one of those children. So, Lord, we're not telling you anything. We're asking you for something. We're asking you for the strength that we need to make a difference. And we need you to help us, Lord, in the way that we communicate. To help others sense the power of your forgiveness so that they can become one of us, amongst us, of those who are making a difference. Lord, you know that we've looked at some very simple truths in the life of David, a man who, like us, had sinned, like us, but found your forgiveness and found your restoration, to be real and to be fresh. And I pray, Lord, that somehow your spirit will tell us, like never before, that you can forgive and you can renew us. We don't deserve it, but you want to do it because you're that kind of a God. And we praise you for this. And we pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus himself. Amen.